Saints of God will sit and God will feed His children. Who wants to be there? And who's going to work for the Master to make sure that we abide in faith and in His righteousness? You know, I came across a verse in Scripture that's been, that I've put to memory. There's sometimes Scripture that we, all, we should be putting to memory. You know, we're living in a time when Jesus is about to come. The earth is being shaken. The earth is even crying out for deliverance. I'm even crying out for deliverance, amen? Every day that passes by, events are happening rapidly. Prophecy is fulfilling. It's a time that all the apostles, all the patriots, long for the day when Jesus would appear in the clouds of glory. And we're here today experiencing the rapid progress of prophecy. That should shake us into crying out to the Lord, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Prepare my heart, put away our sins, put away our conversations, and in, you know, be prepared to receive Jesus. Amen? But friends, we need uh, the presence of Jesus, and the way to get the presence of Jesus is to have the Holy Spirit in our midst. He is God's representative, and He is even here in this church. Jonathan, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Be so, what is the first thing we do when we open the Word of God? We pray. Let us bow our heads and invite the Holy Spirit. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have promised to do a work in this day and age, a work where you will write thy laws upon our hearts and upon our minds. We pray for the sweet, still voice of the Holy Spirit to come in power, to come upon us in this congregation as we worship you, that we might see Jesus, that we might behold him, and we might become changed like him and be ready to see him when he comes in the clouds of glory. Help us understand the living word. Help us apply the principles of Scripture in our lives. Let it mold us and fashion us into lively Christians. Bless us, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So this Scripture that I've memorized, that came across and I said, wow, this is powerful Scripture. And from this Scripture, I'm writing about seven sermons because there's so much in this um, this study that I'm only going to be able to share one aspect of this verse. But who loves the scriptures here? Oh, if there's anything more worthy of contemplation and more time spent is in the study of scripture, everything else fails to give you that source of strength and that encouragement. But sadly today, it's the least book, even though there's the most well-known book and it's been here, it's the least book that's picked out of your library. Sadly, idols have taken over people's living rooms, the TVs, the magazines, the books. And this little book, if we would only open this little book, we would see the wondrous scenes and the future, the history of mankind. The Word of God is powerful, amen? We should treasure this book. We should treasure this book. When I was, um, when I was seven, if there's any seven-year-olds here, my grandmother for my birthday, bought me a little book. You see, this is why we should spend time with our children, talk to them about Jesus, give them gifts. But my grandmother bought me a Bible, and it's a picture Bible. And I didn't know what the Bible was. I was from another country, but I saw the Bible. And I thought, oh, well, every night I'll put it by my bed as a child, and I, I would read from Genesis, and I would just read, even though I didn't understand. I would just read the Bible. So every night I made it a thing as a child, seven, to read the Bible every night. And do you know, even though I didn't know what I was understanding most of the time, it would later come that God would speak to me through His Word. When I'd be working in the farm or in the field, the Word of God would come upon me and I'd just start singing about the Lamb, about sacrifice. And I realize now, it was those times that I spent in prayer or study of my Bible that it all, come, it all came back. And this is why it's important as mothers and grandparents to talk to our children about Jesus. Talk to them about Jesus. Now, the scripture that we're going to study today is taken from 2 Corinthians 1.12. 2 Corinthians 1.12. Beautiful verse. It's a gem in scripture. This is our rejoicing. This is our rejoicing. Notice what our rejoicing is. And this is what I'll be spoke, uh, specifically speaking about today. The testimony 
of our conscience. This is our rejoicing, the testimony of our conscience. And it's only this verse we're going to focus on, this part of the verse. But notice this, that in the simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have held our conversation in the world. It's only by the grace of God, by grace through faith, that we will understand and understand and contemplate this. You know, there seems to be today in the circles of Christendom a supposed joy. And why do I call it a supposed joy? This kind of euphoria of claiming to be a child of God and then to display this reckless um, behavior, whether it's in music, whether it's in dancing, whether it's in you know, screaming for joy, running around. Many churches, you'll see this. You're not blind to these things. Just go onto YouTube, social media. Pastors running down the aisles, rolling. The spurious spirit that seems to have taken over people. Laughing. All this is attributed to the working of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy are clear. That these things will happen more and more as we see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. We'll see things in the churches even in the church which is called to be the last church or last generation that is to prepare people for the coming of Christ. Drums will be introduced into the churches. Singing in this type of praise music which just focuses on the feelings rather than on reason. But this scripture, when we understand it, gives us a real understanding. But the spirit of prophecy, and I'll re there's a reason why I share this. This is what she says in chapter 27. She says, Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to where? The imagination. By exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling, converts thus gain have little desire to listen to Bible truth. Little desire to listen to Bible truth. Little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attraction for them. A message which appeals to unpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's Word relating directly to the eternal interest are unheeded. Why do I bring this to your attention? You might have noticed on the news coming from America... I'm sure you're aware of these Christian revivals that appear to be happening all over America. It's been on the news. It's been on social media. It's been endorsed by politicians, by religious leaders of all Protestant and Catholic institutions, leading leaders in the church. It's been, you know, on the TV, on the social media. You cannot escape from it. It all started in Asbury, Kentucky. And now seems to be spreading all over the United States or all over the universities in America. And what started as a simple student chapel service in Wilmore, Kentucky, this February, spread quickly, globally, like wildfire across the United States by the social media and the news. Of course, they kind of helped push this. It was a nonstop two-week prayer session bringing across the nation in this little small area town a revival they called it a revival prayers were made repentance was seen testimonies was seen casting out demons was also observed accompanied with dancing and what commentary expressed true one commentary said this is true christian joy it is the power of the holy spirit moving upon Christians, and we should accept it as a new norm in the United States. A false spirit is coming upon the United States. We know why this is to be. We know that church and state will unite. It will be the religious Protestants pushing America or the state to pass laws which will restrict the freedom of um, the people. We know this with climate and what's happening all over the world. Now, the apostle in this verse, though, gives us a true understanding 
of the work of the Holy Spirit and the expression of true joy. Who wants true joy? I want true joy. The happy peace, that satisfaction of the Spirit that we can have that arises from where? The verse tells us the testimony of our conscience. What is this conscience and the testimony of our conscience that brings joy and reflects the glory of God is our study today. Let me ask a question. What is our conscience? Isn't it interesting that the testimony of who we are and what we say, the apostle then says that we've had our conversation in this world. It's by the mouth. You know, my teacher used to say to me when I was a student in um, uh, primary school, Chris, before you speak, think of what you're going to say. Because I used to say all kinds of things. Anything that came to my mouth, I would say it. Just so I could be the laugh of, the, of all my friends. So I had so many friends. And you say anything to Chris, he'll come up with anything. And it used to really bother my teacher. So she pulled me aside one day. She goes, Chris, I need to say something to you. Think before you speak. That's what she used to say to me. Still didn't understand it really well because I went back to doing what I always do. Now, when we recognize that man, and this is what I want you to recognize, man is a conscience being. You see, God has given every one of us, every individual, the ability to do what? To think. To perceive things that are where? In the past, current, and in the future. To reflect upon it. That is that we're capable of thinking upon whatever enters our hearts, whatever enters our minds through our eyes, whatever comes in and whatever goes out. We feel, we do, we have emotions. Our behaviors are processed. What comes and leaves our minds. God has made us responsible, conscious, a consciousness to have conscious. And this is why Christ said in Matthew 12, 36, but I say unto you, he said, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Wow, that, that hit me really hard. For I've been really, in my conversation, I said, Lord, from my youth up, I was trying to make everyone laugh. I could make things up, I could tell stories. But the Lord is saying, Chris, every word, and I say, Lord, have mercy. Praise God that in the book of in heaven, there's a book, Lamb's book of life, and in our names, we can be erased from the Lamb's of de death to life, and Christ's name is written there, and he forgives us of all our sins. Amen? Amen. But when we're forgiven, and we accept Jesus Christ, are we going to go back to that old way, the old nature, and speak as we used to speak? No. God does something wonderful, amen? God does want something wonderful. That is why it's important, as my teacher says, Chris, think. Before you speak, before you act and do, think about your decision and choices that you're going to make. In other words, every one of us is given this inward perception of whatever pertains to you or to me or to whatever, whatever's past, present. All our thoughts, emotions, outward behaviors, God has given us an inward perception. But it implies more than just this, friends. It's not merely having a knowledge of our own selves, of our past, current, and future, but it's to bear witness to. In all its bearing, it's to accuse or excuse ourselves, to approve, to disprove, to forgive and condemn, to accept or not to accept. In other words, another word for this is morality. Knowing between right and wrong. And this is why we know that all Scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God. Profitable to what? All doctrine. It teaches the whole will of God. David said, Lord, help me to number the days of my life. He also said, set a watch over my mouth that I might never speak until you tell me what to speak. All Scripture, that the man of God may be what? Fully furnished unto what? A perfect man for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in what? Righteousness it is the Word of God 
that brings light to the conscience. Amen? To receive, what is it we're receiving? The rule of what is right and what is wrong. You see, the believer esteems nothing right or wrong unless it is where? Directed by Scripture. The conscience is directed by what? By our taste, not by our taste, not by our sights, not by our desires, not by our passions, but where? To the rule, to the principle of Scripture. Amen? And this is why Christ says, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Oh, to eat the daily manna every day. Amen? Why do we need to get up early in the mornings to dedicate ourselves to Christ? You see, the morning, you know, Christ always likens the things of nature. There's nature lessons book, like Sari said. You know, early in the mornings, the shepherd used to take the sheep out into the pastures. He'd wake up three, four in the morning. Why early in the morning would he take the sh you know, sheep? Let them sleep. But no, he didn't. He'd wake them up and take them to green pastures. Why early in the morning? Because he knew early in the morning when the, the dew would be set on the grass, it would be a lot easier for them to chew. Chew the grass. You know, as sheep, we wake up early in the morning that the Spirit may come and teach us and prepare us for the day. But how many have rejected or stopped having their Bible studies in the morning? Oh, reasons why. They stay up late at night even in the Adventist circles. Many Adventists are staying up one, two, or three in the morning. Well, I got emails. Oh, I'm fixing some food. I'm, um, I got to prepare for everything, but God has never made that. This is not what God wants. Early to bed, early to wise, what's the saying? The early bird always gets the early worm. But many are struggling to get up in the mornings. And we ask why they get annoyed, why they're angry, why they're not getting things in order. Because they're rushing, they're busy, they rush and rush, and there's no time for Jesus. But our first, first thing we should do when we wake up is what? Surrender our lives to Jesus. You see, here alone is where you're going to get a good conscience between, toward God and to your fellow man. A conscience that is void of offense. You know, the apostle could say with surety about his faith and life. What did, the, what did he say under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Apostle Paul? If you read Acts 23, 1, if you have your Bible, turn there. Um, what did Paul's testimony say to the brethren or to the council? This is what he said. And Paul earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived, what? In all good conscience before God until this day. Is there anyone here that can say that? Well, I'm not. Who's going to raise their hand? But the apostle could. I have lived till this day in good conscience toward God. I want that testimony. We can have that testimony. Don't look back. We have to look forward from today, from henceforth, from leaving this church. Come Sunday, I'm going to live that I might have this good conscience until the day that Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. Amen? And he goes on to say, well, how did he do this? I want to know how the apostle did this because he's my example, such as all the other apostles and disciples. Jesus is my example. Amen? He says in Acts 24, 16, notice what he says. He says this, And herein do I exercise myself. What did he do? Exercise himself. To have always conscience void to offense toward um, God and toward men. The exercise of living faith. Are we exercising? Are we cultivating faith? How does it come? By reading and applying the word of God. That's the testimony of our conscience. If we're going to be rejoicing, and we're going to have that rejoicing, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice forever, then we need to be in the light of His countenance. Christ says, He that followeth me shall what? 
have the what? Light of life. He shall not walk in darkness. He shall not walk in darkness. And friends, I'm going to tell you now, the earth is really dark. There's so much darkness in this world. But I carry the greatest light, the lamp. Thy word is a what? Light unto my path. And a lamp unto what? My feet. Do you carry the word of God, friends? Carry it in your mind. We are to be living epistles, amen? Lively Christians. Herein do I exercise myself. God's perfect holy will. His character is found in Scripture. And by faith, we are to receive His character. It's impossible for us to walk this rule if we do not what it means to be in Christ, to believe in Jesus Christ. A true knowledge of Jesus will be seen where? In the testimony of our conscience. This is why the apostle says, but of Him, of who? Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? who of God is made into us, what? Wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. If we are to have a true knowledge of our hearts and live today to please God, it must be revealed to us by His Word and we must act upon His Word and that is living faith. If we have not received Him, we will not walk with Him. We will not walk in His steps. But how are we to know our own hearts? We are to come to Christ and we're to reason with Him and come into agreement with Him where our hearts, our emotions and thoughts and behaviors and conversations are submitted to that rule of Scripture. If we're to have a conscience, a good conscience, you can have an evil conscience that is separated from God separated from His Word. We can have that inward perception, an agreement with the Lord, for Him to be your God and you to be His child. Amen? This is what I mean, a habitual perception, a daily occurrence that you are following God and you're following in His light. In Him was light, in Him was life, and the life was what? the light of men. A good conscience does not come by chance, brothers and sisters. There's a theory, the new theology teaches that when Jesus comes, it doesn't matter what you do. All that matters is if you accept Jesus, believe in His cross, you are forgiven, and you will be in the kingdom. Everything else doesn't really matter. Because Jesus is forgiven of your sins. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, in the twinkling of eye, your character will be changed. This is a new theology that has spread wildfire in our churches all over America since 1950 or since a new theology. When men started going into the universities, many universities, many of our ministers come back with PhDs, masters studying the theology schools and come and teach this message. Morris Vinden, we have... Um, you, uh, Dr. Ford, Brimsmead, men who have risen in the church as Adventists, who then go into the schools to study theology, to come back into our churches and teach this message, evangelical theology, that it doesn't matter what you do as long as you believe that Jesus died for you and you're forgiven. So whatever you do, it won't be held against you. But that's not what the Bible teaches, does it? The Bible is clear. We have to have a true conscience before God. You see, the Bible is clear. There's no other foundation that can be laid. 1 Corinthians 11. Which is already laid. Which is what? What is the rule? Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Now if you build on the foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, look at what it says, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. What day will declare it, friends? When Jesus comes. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what work and what sort it is. We cannot build upon Him without having this living faith. 
No one is a partaker of Christ until we can clearly testify the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the life of faith. This is the life of faith. It is in faith alone. It's in the scriptures alone that our conscience testifies and glorifies God and we are found to be in the true expression of joy. Because our conversation, by the grace of God, is what? Untoward heavenly. The wonder, you see, what's happened, friends, is the wonderful things of God has been opened before us. Is it not the promise of God? Is it not the promise of God? What did God promise? What did He say? What did He say to, um, to us that He would do in the last days? He said this, I will change man's heart. I will change man's mind. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in where? Their inward parts. And I will write it in their hearts. And I will be what? Their God and they shall be my people. God writes His laws in our hearts. Amen? This is His work that He wants to do for every single one of us here today. He wants to write it in our inward parts. You see, because we would expect that those who are Christians, who say they are Christians, will resemble and imitate His character. This is what God wants to do for His children, for His church. He wants to write His laws upon our hearts and our minds. And then, what would happen when He does write His laws in our minds? What's our conversation going to be? What's the testimony of our lives? We'll be pure, we'll be holy, and we will declare the good news of the gospel, and we will share the truths to those in our families, those in our neighborhoods, not these conversations we're hearing today. You know, I'm no auditor, but if I were to audit and go into Adventist homes or into their churches, into their potlucks, and I had keen ears, and I could write out all the conversations, sadly, brothers and sisters, I would tell you that Christ is rarely mentioned. But you know what is mentioned? Oh, you heard the latest news? Maybe you have the latest car. Um, oh, my house, I'm building a bigger house. I'm, um, you know, did you hear about so-and-so, what she did or he did? Gossip runs like fire. You wouldn't believe what, you know, these are the conversations. And yet God has given us such a wonderful thing, the Word of God. You see, but there's something that God says, Romans, turn with me to Romans 2.14. There's something happening here. He says, Paul says, For when the Gentiles, who are these? The Gentiles. Notice this. The Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So there is many outside of this faith outside of this church who have the law written in their hearts and are more moral, are more good than those in the house of Israel. This is what he says, their conscience also bear witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. How does this apply to the revivals today? You see, God's word must direct all things that take place with things that according to what he, he has programmed under his program. These false revivals, like Sister Weiss said, do not bring attention to the Word of God new to the Christian life. Satan has blindly come and distra put distraction, preparing a people to reject the truth. While under all this, what's going on? The image of the beast is being formed. 
the mark of the beast is going to be enforced. But we as a people who have the law written in our hearts, we are to declare the, the wonderful good news of the gospel. His law is written in our hearts. We are in the face of Jesus Christ, in the light of the gospel. We are to go forth and share the truth. A brother called me last night, a missionary, called me around um, 8 o'clock and I had two hours of talking to him. We were talking about the work in this country and how it was proceeding. And he said, Chris, we need to bring the Sabbath rest to the people. And he said to me, Chris, why are you warming the pews? Are you doing the Lord's work, he said. Are you out in the streets? Are you sharing? He says, I go every day, every Sabbath. He says, um, he says I, I don't go to church on Sabbath. I said, why don't you go to church? He says, my Sabbath is on the streets. Isaiah 28, Isaiah 58. And he was quoting scripture to me. And he goes, I go on the streets every Sabbath. That's my life. God has given me rest. Now I need to go give this rest to other people. And he said to me, I said, well, share me a, tell, tell me a testimony. He said, Chris, let me share something with you. I went down to London, and he says, during the time of the pandemic, and the, you know, everyone was there marching, and he says, I had my trolley. This is a lone missionary here. I had my trolley full of books, but I thought I'd take two trolleys. But I didn't realize, Chris, that I couldn't carry two trolleys down when there's so many people converging in the London on the streets. I said, what did you have in your trolleys? He said, I had the great controversies, I had the tracks. I wanted to share the message, a perfect opportunity. He says, I was alone this time though. So I said, how did you carry these two big things then? He said, Chris, I realized something, I needed the Lord's help. So he says, I got on my knees, right there in the middle of the parade, and I said, Lord, I can't, I can't carry two, I've made a mistake, I carried two big things, but I can't do it. And then he said that um, this man um, came to him, big tall man, came to him with a baby on his shoulder and holding another baby here and had a teenager on his hand. And he said to his teenager, I guess left the teenager, and says, oh, he said to him, I will take your, let me take these and I will take, I'll put the books out. Didn't know who he was, didn't know if he was a non-Adventist, but the man just started grabbing books and giving it to people. Now, this man said he had more appeal to the people than he, the missionary. People were just taking the books from him, just taking the books. And he would say to the people, you need this book. Take this book and go read it. And the missionary said, I said, did you ask his name? Did you take a picture of him? He goes, no. He says, I, just, I was just caught up, how tall. And he says, not only that, Chris, he would, he would go. He'd take the whole, and I thought, oh, no, what's going to happen to my books and my, and my cart? And he said he'd just go. And then he says he'd found me. He would come back and says, where's some more books? And he says, I didn't get his name. I don't know who he was. This tall man with a baby on his neck, with a child on his arm, there in books. And he said, Chris, I believe that was an angel that come and answer to my prayer. You see, God wants us to work for him. He wants us to be on the streets. Maybe some of us can't be on the streets. There's no reason why we can't do something for the Lord. Tracks, Put them on your car, wherever. Teach the people that the Lord is coming. Do you believe He's coming? Where's our joy then? What did the Bible say? For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the what? The cross. Who was this? For the joy that was set before Him. What was Jesus' joy? Yeah, He was the day when all his people would be in New Jerusalem or in, in the kingdom of heaven. He would be feeding them. He foresaw all this. He saw the big picture, didn't he? And therefore he was willing to take up his cross. I wonder, have you taken up the cross? Have you taken up the cross? It's a heavy cross. It's not a light cross. It's a heavy cross. And what I mean by heavy cross, what do I mean by heavy cross? Taking upon yourself the heavy cross. What does that mean? The Bible says, he that denieth 
It's about, it's about um, <coughs> um, self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice for the cause of God. It's not easy to, to, um, to um, let go of self, is it? It's a strong battle. But God says, I will do it. I will write my laws upon your minds. I will write it upon your hearts. You will be spirit-filled people. I will lead you. I will guide you. And you need not fear what's going to happen, what is about to happen, what is happening in society. I will be your guide. Amen? I want to be filled with the Spirit. Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you're filled with His presence. I want to know that God is walking by my side. I want to know that I'm doing His will. That's the only time that I can really rejoice and that my conscience is clear. The testimony of my, you know, conscience. The joy. What does the verse continue saying? So this is our rejoicing, the testimony of our conscience and the simplicity. Simplicity is a lesson that many of us haven't learned yet. And simplicity and what? Godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. I have had my conversation in this world. That's all we have in this world, friends. That is all we have in this world, our character and our conversation. Amen? What should we be talking about in our homes? What should we be talking about in our churches? Not the latest Hollywood Marvel things I hear from the youth or Adventists or the latest thing coming out of Hollywood or the latest music or the latest... I hear so much of these things. You know, sometimes I say, Lord, I just want to shut myself away just with the Word of God. Sometimes I just want to spend time with Jesus. You can understand why Enoch had to live in the mountains, amen? He had his own house in the mountains, but it didn't mean he separated from the people. We're told that Enoch, who walked with God, would go then down into the cities, and he would teach the people. He would converse with the people. And we're told that he would find the people, and then he would bring them back to his Christian post and teach them the truth. Enoch was a, another one that had the testimony of his conscience. Amen? That was pure. What about you and I? Where does our interest lie in? Our families, our cooking, our, um, our dress, more, maybe more properties, maybe increasing in our job pay, our profession. Maybe it should be in the things that matter to God, the things in the kingdom. Do you believe Jesus is coming? Do we all need to prepare? Is God speaking to you each day? Is he want you, does you think he wants you in the kingdom of heaven? Praise God. He called you from when you were a child. As I reflect on my life, I now realize that God called me to be his child from the age of, um, all the way from the age of four or five, I can remember now. Why then I was taken away from Guatemala. You know, when I was in, in sharing, I went to Guatemala, I was asked to preach in a church. So many Adventist churches there, and I went there. I didn't speak the language, but my brother-in-law um, could translate. And they asked me, because the visiting speaker hadn't shown up, and I had just been sitting there waiting for church, in this Spanish-speaking church, someone tapped me and says, you preach. I was like, what? Okay, Lord, give me, give me the preach. And I got up there, and I said to them, right over there, about 500 yards, it's a hill, I was born in a little shack. And it was a shack. I'd say, you know, this side of the room, the little shack was as big as that, and that's where I was born, and that's where I lived, under three crosses. And there my mother died, and I saw her being a funeral. But it was there even then that the Lord appealed to me, even when I was there. I can remember now, 
I wanted to know what was going on. And then I was adopted, and then I came to America, and then my grandma gives me the Bible, and then um, I realized the Lord was speaking. So as a child, the Lord is speaking. And I know if you were to go look back and reflect on your life, you knew there was times in your life when God appealed to you, even as a child. God was calling. He was drawing us. And now, where is our Christian experience now? Have we, mat have we matured in our faith? Or are we still back and forth? I don't want a back and forth Christian experience. That's what the new theology teaches, that your Christian experience is supposed to be like this. But let me tell you, how many times when you do this finally, you finally give up. You finally get discouraged. Yes, there's going to be hiccups, yeah? But your eyes are always going to go forward. That walk is going to be like that. It's going to go straight up. Constantly battling, constantly praying, walking, marching, climbing, leaning. When it doesn't cease to be climbing, what's happening? It's going backwards. God is preparing His people today. I believe that God is preparing each and every one of us. God wants us in His kingdom. But how much do you want it? Is the question. Do you want it enough to put away your idols, your conversations? And are you willing to come down deep into the Word of God? Spend morning, evenings, daylight talking to the Lord? God has promised, and He will not fail any one of us. God is faithful. But I pray that your true joy is rejoicing in the testimony of your conscience. What's happening in your mind? Who has taken your mind? Who sits in the frontal lobe or the limbic system where all emotions and joys and things take place? Let Christ be enthroned in your mind, friends. What I'm saying is, receive God's divine nature. Amen? And you can only do that through the study and application of the Word of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of His Word. Amen.